All right. Um, man, this is, this is fantastic. My presentation today uh, is going to uh, focus on one really intriguing idea. It's probably um, the coolest idea that I've had the pleasure of being involved with uh, for quite some time. I mean, burnt ends uh, is right up there. Uh, but this whole concept of, of government as a platform, if you've heard of it, cool. Um, Google it, government as a platform, city as a platform. And while there are certainly digital implications uh, of this concept overall, um, I'm going to focus on something that's a lot more relatable to everybody and that you can actually do. Um, it, to get started, I did want to say, uh, if you've ever seen Royal Tannenbaums, and there's that scene where the, West, uh, or the Owen Wilson character is, is like, you know, I always wanted to be a Tannenbaum. Uh, I always wanted to make a presentation at ELGL. Uh, <laughs> you guys rock. <laughs> this is a fantastic community, uh, and, and it is thrilling to get a chance to share ideas with you all. Um, we even have a happy hour tonight, so uh, I hope from the ideas that we talk about, um, we get a chance to talk about them further. Uh, as Nick mentioned, my work uh, for years now has been in the creation of, of a solution to a, a very interesting problem, uh, and the problem is that for all of us in local government, we have, we have a future that we're trying to create uh, for our communities. We want to do something really good. You all as ELGL members um, especially, you're trying to think five years into the future and, and what it is that you're trying to create that will make your community, your city, your county exceptional. And yet at the same time, it's really hard because we don't have enough money to um, actually create this wonderful future that we envision. And so um, while one of my uh, tools, one of my creations has been priority-based budgeting, uh, which is a tool to address this very issue, um, for the rest of today's presentation, I'm going to talk about a, a narrow uh, but very compelling application of, of priority-based budgeting. Um, quickly, though, I have to tell you a little bit about priority-based budgeting. It is a tool to try to solve that problem, the problem of having so much that we really want to do uh, and yet uh, feeling like we, don't, we might not have the resources to get it done. And what PBB is meant to do is to, to frame the problem a little bit uh, differently and say, um, we basically have two levers to try to tackle this challenge. We have the expense side of the equation, and we have the revenue side of the equation. So very basic. We're trying to just like, make it simple here. Uh, on the expense side, what's really intriguing um, is that we have the opportunity to perhaps free up the resources that we already have uh, in order to rethink how we might redeploy those resources towards these programs that you may wish to start in your future. That's, that's one solution to the problem. And of course, there's the revenue side uh, as well, which is how can we possibly bring in additional resources uh, overall to our organization. And for uh, all of my work in priority-based budgeting, while it's meant to um, tell you what all of those opportunities are, to uh, enumerate them, uh, this whole concept of city as a platform, government as a platform, uh, what is intriguing to me about it is that this concept is uh, yet a, another really powerful solution to this problem of how we free up perhaps our own resources. So I'm going to build a lot of mystery uh, and then just make this like dramatic climb to an incredible conclusion uh, for the rest of this presentation. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. Uh, it's like a magician. Um, so first, to start with a thought experiment. Uh, like Lawrence uh, talked about earlier, it's, consider it rhetorical, but I want you to think about it. If you, in your particular local government, um, had all of the money that comes into you, all of the resources, your entire annual budget guaranteed, you have all those resources coming to you, would you rebuild your government in the exact same way that it looks today? Um, so imagine however many millions you have, even if you're a very tiny community, is Mitch Foster in the house? Uh, Winnicon, shout out. Uh, very small community, like a million dollar budget, um, up to when I was in Jefferson County, is a uh, half a billion dollar budget, I think. I don't know, Don, if, if roughly that um, amount of money. Yeah, cool. That's a lot of money. So, in your thought experiment, hold this in your mind, and I'm going to weave our way back here. If you had all that money coming in today, and yet none of the services that you actually provide, as you think about building the community that you want to build, would you engineer it? Would you design it? to look exactly like you have it today. So hold that thought in mind. It's a very fun one to, to think about in the middle of the night. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, on a, a little bit of discussion of our journey um, with this question in mind. So as Nick mentioned, I've been working on the budget, the budget as a tool to solve that problem about wanting to create a great community, but not necessarily having the resources to do it. 
Um, I, I tackled this problem through the budget process. You can tackle this exact same problem through uh, any other direction. In fact, many of the speakers today uh, talked about different ways to handle it through organizational culture and strategy, and there's a whole host of different ways to do it. I chose the budget process, and over the years, we've seen an evolving use of the budget process as this tool, uh, kind of four levels of budget mastery as we rethink it um, to try to solve this problem overall. And I want to walk you through quickly, because it's going to lead us to City as a platform, um, how these communities have rethought their budget process overall. First and foremost, um, the, uh, the communities who started using priority-based budgeting as this uh, attempt to solve this problem considered it as a very rational tool to get the right data. Anybody participate in the What Works Cities um, exercises yesterday? A lot of you. Uh, they're uh, of like minds um, that they are trying to get the right data uh, to accelerate the improvement of people's lives. That's their mission overall. And we too figured we have to start somewhere. We have to get the right data uh, overall if we're going to try to solve this problem uh, that we're trying to solve. And it, as Nick mentioned, I'm a, I'm a local, um, and I actually went to the Colorado School of Mines. Don't hold it against me. Uh, they didn't teach us public speaking, but what they did teach us is that this is the, <laughs> this is the coolest chart uh, that you can possibly ever reference in a presentation. If you get the chance to, you should. <laughs> and so at the Colorado School of Mines, they said, think about it. For any problem that we want to solve, we have our fundamental elements here on Earth. And here in this beautiful chart, we've distilled everything that we might want to know about these fundamental elements so that we can go forth and solve the world's problems. They will have you believe that the, everything you need to know is right here in this chart. So uh, with what I learned at Mines, um, I endeavored to do the same thing, kind of. Uh, so we have hydrogen, we have its atomic number, and we can understand some great things about this uh, particular element. And I wanted to do the same thing for our elements of government. So what are the fundamental elements? Maybe they are the programs and services that we offer. Lawrence hit that topic earlier today. He said they got down to the service level. What are all the things that are provided within the departments that we have? Um, and maybe instead of atomic number or spin, uh, we have something like uh, the workload uh, indicators, so the FTE that are applied to provide a particular program um, or the cost uh, of that program overall. So that's interesting. So I, I was thinking if we can create this kind of periodic table, and, and maybe you could too, what are the things that we do? How much does it cost? Uh, what are the workload indicators? And, and then maybe, uh, and Sarah Moss was talking about this in her presentation when she was referencing the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and then Denver City Council and Schoolhouse Rock, which was great. Uh, she was talking about, well, maybe we want to know other things about this program, like are we mandated to do it? Um, so is the program mandated? Or another interesting question is, how mandated is it? Is it a federal mandate? Is it a state mandate? Is it a local mandate? Um, we might want to know, does it recover its cost? Does somebody pay for it? Is there anybody else out there who provides a service kind of like the one that we provide? Um, does it serve the entirety of our population? and so on and so forth. And, and we might go further and layer on additional information about this thing like, um, by providing it, do we actually make our community safer? Um, if we provide this program, does it improve uh, local economic vitality? Does it improve the health and well-being of our citizens? So I think you see what we're doing. Um, I was using the budget process just to say, what are these fundamental elements? What are the services? And what is everything we might want to know about these services? If we're going to get the right data, like what Work Cities does, and then go back and try to solve this problem uh, about the future that we're trying to create. So in priority-based budgeting, it's exactly what you do. You end up with every program uh, with a cost, an FTE equivalent, and a revenue. Um, and as you can relate these services back to the things that you're trying to achieve here in Boise, Idaho, uh, you might have something similar where you, you clearly state in very colorful and, and perfect ways all the things that you're trying to do. We call them results. Lawrence calls them outcomes and budgeting for outcomes. Uh, we get really clear on our purpose. Why do we spend a single tax dollar overall? It's to do things like make our community safer, increase economic vitality, whatever it is for your community. Um, and, and the magic uh, is that you can measure the spending uh, towards the programs that actually go to achieve these results so we can ascertain how much are we investing in a safe and secure community, strong, diverse local economy, and so on. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and that's kind of level one uh, for our communities, is they, they can now relate resources to results. And we have a periodic table. We know what we're doing uh, and what it costs. And, and some communities have gone even further to say, well, 
It's not just about um, uh, going through this and, and understanding this basic alignment uh, towards our strategic plan or towards the results that we're trying to achieve. Um, although uh, here's Branson, Missouri, who has done the same thing. Um, but we can come to appreciate even further of every dollar related to every program related to the results we're trying to accomplish. Um, are there some programs that actually have a greater degree of influence? And so we, we try to prioritize the spending overall, um, where what you're looking at, uh, there's these four levels, and it's a key visualization of the work where the top tier, uh, Lawrence mentioned the report card, it's like getting an A on the test. These are the services that you provide that have the greatest degree of impact on the things that you're trying to do. So it's pretty rational, it's just a, a measurement system, a framework to understand of your entire budget, how does it look when we can see it in relationship to programs and those programs uh, and their influence on the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Level two, quartile two, um, are also programs that have a tremendous degree of influence, just it's a relative differentiation. They have less influence uh, than the quartile one programs. Finally, of quartile three and ultimately quartile four programs, which simply demonstrate that they have less and less to do with results. It's all relative. And what's neat is that uh, for these level two communities, you can look at it from an organizational perspective or here in Chandler, Arizona, they can break it down to an individual employee so this is a, a person, a human being, and their time as illustrated uh, by way of the programs they support and the quartiles they landed in. So on an individual level, we can go through and see while this person, the city communication coordinator, spends some majority of their time on quartile two, some on quartile one programs. Over here on the right-hand side, um, there's a lot of capacity, perhaps, uh, that is available. And now things start to get kind of interesting. If this is how one employee looks, how might it look across the entire organization and if I'm their supervisor, might I find the opportunity to free them up from some of the things that they've been tasked to do in order to reallocate their resources towards new programs that we want to get into? Remember, that's the whole blueprint. We're trying to look for those solutions. Where can we free up and optimize the resources that we already have? This would be one possibility. Free them up from services that they're spending their time on that have less and less influence on the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Uh, speaking of what works cities, um, what's been really cool is that they've incorporated this very philosophy into their certification, this mindset uh, of how can we free up the resources that we already have. And what it starts to look like over time um, is that from one year to the next to the next, you start to see a migration. So this is uh, Branson, Missouri, and they start to take their resources and they get out of the business of some things in Quartal 4. Uh, and what they're doing, they're not... Um, uh, Sarah Moss had talked about this earlier in terms of the psychology. Um, they're not laying off these people necessarily, but they're redeploying them towards new services that they want to start. So you pull back on Quartal 4 and you pull back on Quartal 3 and you push those resources towards Quartal 1 uh, and Quartal 2 overall. So, you, so these communities, if you're following along, very simple. Um, first and foremost, you get the data. Second, you understand how your resources are aligned with results. Uh, you prioritize, and over time, you can start to tinker with this idea of resource reallocation and, and begin to get good at it. Um, so we then move into level three, uh, where the level three communities recognize this. Priority-based budgeting is just a very simple framework. Resources to programs, programs to results, uh, and the name of the game is how can we um, reallocate from within, and the question becomes, how far can we go with this? Uh, and uh, if you understand that all of the prioritization is relative to these outcomes, it begs the question to you all, what are you really hoping to achieve? What, what truly do you want to accomplish by way of the results that you're setting? Kalamazoo, Michigan uh, is, is a very uh, incredibly interesting community. And in Kalamazoo, they understand PBB what it is, this basic uh, engine to take resources out of certain areas and push them towards others. And they have stated as their objective that they're going to try to end generational poverty. So they're using priority-based budgeting as this engine to pull as many resources as possible and push them towards these new programs to end generational poverty overall. Simultaneously, it also helps in Kalamazoo. They have a $70 million philanthropic grant from their uh, local community. Uh, <laughs> some people from Stryker, a problem that many of you probably don't have. Um, but but it's, it's pretty fascinating. And I'm going to stay on this Kalamazoo thread for a second. Here's Jim Ritzma, uh, their city manager. Um, he's been doing this budget process for 20 years, and I like the quote because many of you might be able to identify with Jim's feeling. He's like, yeah, it's a budget process. Um, 
and each year, at most, we might get like a 3% increase or a 5% increase, or even if we get something bigger than that, it's, it's short-lived, and then we go back to something small. And his takeaway from, from this um, environment that we live in is when you're, you're only used to um, incremental increases or incremental decreases, you start to box yourself in. This is what Jim says, um, that it's unrealistic to start to talk about massive results that you would really love to accomplish if only you had the money and the people to do it. Because if the budget's only increasing 3% or 5%, you can only kind of work around the edges with one key assumption. And that is that you're going to continue to do everything that you're already doing today. And he says what, what has been really fascinating about this framework of reallocation is that if we can reorient our minds to say, we can free up as much as we want. There's a trade-off, but we can free up as much as we want to push after those results. Then you can start to really talk about interesting things that you want to accomplish. And so that's what this starts to look like for these level three communities is, is really pulling back uh, here on, on Quartal 4 and Quartal 3 and pushing a lot of resources without necessarily having to ask um, for new revenues or, or new resources overall for the community. So I've now brought you up to speed on the last 20 years of my life. Uh, <laughs> Lawrence had a nice timeline in his presentation and uh, I, I should have had something similar. Um, this is what we've been doing, this resource reallocation game. And there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting article by a guy named Michael Schrage, and is in Harvard Business Review, and he said, when it comes to innovation and change, and I know this is a business that Nick is in, one takeaway from, from this particular author was, um, the most successful innovators don't just tell people what to do differently, um, they actually ask them to adopt a new philosophy and behave differently. Uh, and take on a new value system. And, and in reflection on that article, the value system that we're talking about here is that massive, substantial resource reallocation, getting out of certain things that we provide and pushing those resources to something else is a mindset and a philosophy um, that you can take pretty far. So let's talk about how far we can take it. Remember, this is like this exciting build-up. I got you all on the edge of your seats. Uh, <laughs> so level four communities. Um, so this is, this is intriguing. Let me take a sip. Oh, a dramatic pause, because I'm getting excited now, too. OK. You start to realize one thing that's, that's interesting. If you're Kalamazoo, you can play the PBB game, the resource reallocation game. And what you, what you recognize is that you can optimize all you wish within your organization, within city hall, within county government, within your special district. And you can do a fantastic job. But a big breakthrough happens when you realize that you are but one entity, but one provider uh, among many in your community. And if you can start to understand who all these other entities are and leverage their resources and align their resources together, now we're talking about big money, not just your government's budget, but leveraging all of your community's resources. Uh, for those of you who have been um, uh, interested in some books, ELGL does a great job of book reports. So I have two quick book reports here. Um, the same theme has come up in two different books that are uh, really um, new and relevant. Bruce Katz's New Localism, which is kind of just chapter two of the Metro Revolution, uh, is a little bit updated, but same theme, right? In Metro Revolution, if you read that book, uh, Katz is saying um, it, it's high time that uh, if we want to have successful communities and local government, um, dependence on our federal government is... Uh, challenging, uh, and the state government is similar. And so it is upon us as local government leaders to take control of our own destiny and, and minimize our dependence overall. So take control of your own destiny. In the new localism, what he's truly focused on um, are these stories, and he goes through Pittsburgh and Indianapolis and Copenhagen, of how, how Pittsburgh didn't just tackle the resurgence of Pittsburgh on its own, but it figured out from the university sector, from the private sector, from the nonprofits, who are all these other players, and how can we start to understand what they're doing, and how can we partner with them to free up our own resources and, and go after um, achieving wonderful things for our society. So three dramatic case studies, all, par all focused on this idea of working with other entities overall. Um, Stephen Goldsmith and uh, uh, Neil Kleiman, um, wrote a similar book, but it's like a totally different metaphor, and there's this new city operating system, and they focus on, on the same idea, 
uh, Goldsmith, former mayor of Indianapolis, um, draws on some of his own stories, of course, but uh, modernizes them. And they talk about a new city operating system in computer uh, metaphors as if we're all kind of nodes in this system. Five minutes. Uh, and, and we're trying to figure out um, how to understand what each other does and collaborate and cooperate. Um, so th this is all very fascinating. Um, and it's been, it's been done before. Uh, it's been done before under a specific class of simply talking about outsourcing, though, which is the limitation. It's like the Apple uh, conversation from earlier, words matter. And sourcing and outsourcing are very sticky situations. Phoenix had managed competition. East Lansing, Michigan had bid to goal. Indianapolis uh, did, uh, talked about distributed uh, governance overall. In Pittsburgh, we have these concepts of the new localism. Um, and what, what we're really starting to, to come to understand is we have to um, pinpoint and map and inventory what are all these other entities doing. Well, Washington County, Wisconsin got pretty interested in this whole concept overall. Uh, and what they did, they took their program inventory, trying to adopt these concepts of new localism and new city operating system, um, and they simply went out to other neighboring counties with their list. That's all they did. They said, do you offer something similar to what we do? And lo and behold, many of the other counties said, absolutely, we do. Uh, they decided to merge uh, public health uh, departments, public health departments offering many services within. As the two entities came together, you bet they identified duplicative services overall. Um, they got rid of the services without getting rid of the people, and they took the people and redeployed them to new programs that neither one of the entities could start without raising taxes. It's like a perfect merger, right? That's what you're hoping to be able to accomplish. Uh, and the, the, the takeaway is it's not just sourcing. Um, for any of you who have uh, been Jim Collins fans, um, the idea is how can we pinpoint these programs that we want to do less of or that we can eliminate, in, not just to be efficient or shrink government, but to free up the resources to do other things uh, that we really want to get into. Remember, this is the goal. So we're moving towards the punchline. I think we've got less than five minutes here, so this is uh, buckle up, right? Uh, massive resource optimization. So um, with Washington County in your minds about one simple merger of a health department, uh, the question now becomes how far can we actually take this? Toledo, Ohio um, has adopted this concept of government as a platform. And the metaphor goes something like this. Uh, you take your smartphone, your iPhone, and when Apple first came out with the iPhone, uh, there were a certain number of apps that you had access to. There's a calendar app, a way to access the internet. You could still make a phone call. It was great. Um, but the people who used it uh, started to look at the phone, and, and they said, but it doesn't offer the kind of services that I would like. And they actually hacked the phone. They were known as jailbreakers. And Apple faced this conundrum. Do we shut them down? Uh, or do we welcome the fact that there are other potential service providers if we can create a secure environment for them to operate? And that's exactly what, we, what they did. And that ushered in the era of, of the App Store as we know it, where you have hundreds of thousands uh, of app providers um, and not just Apple and its own limited set of designers. So Toledo, having the same idea, said, what if we can create the App Store for government? And it's not just digital, but for all services that we provide. And by opening up specifically with their Chamber of Commerce, the chamber representing um, all of the small businesses and local uh, businesses within the city, is asking the same question. Government as a platform, how can we ask, are there other potential service providers overall? You take something like street sweeping, it's a very important program to the city of Toledo. It's Quartal II, a $4.2 million program. But they're simply recognizing there are other potential service providers out there and it's not a bad thing if somebody else can take it off of your plate if you can free up your resources and redeploy them uh, for other road improvement programs that they need to get into. Um, Sarah Moss talked about an impound lot. Toledo's going after their impound lot. But the whole idea being, do we as local government, is this uniquely what we're in the business of uh, providing overall? Um, and they're not stopping. They have hundreds of programs on the table. Uh, and a stated goal of trying to free up somewhere around 20% of their budget uh, entirely. Um, we take one more small example, and I promise I'll finish up in one minute, uh, coming to the end here. Um, big city like Toledo, how about a small organization like Moffitt County, Colorado, less than 15,000 people? They went through this exact same exercise of a matchup, uh, and within the first few minutes, the hospital CEO, another entity who is there, is looking at the inventory of Moffitt County services and says, Wow, you guys do laundry services? Turns out that the county actually has a laundry service within their detention center. 
uh, and the hospital CEO, not realizing that the county offered this at all, um, ships their laundry two and a half hours down to Grand Junction, spends hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, and they're simply realizing, man, there's a true partnership opportunity here on the table. How big is the partnership opportunity in Moffitt County? Uh, basically, 59% of their budget overall lends itself well for discussions of things that other entities uh, are actually providing. Um, I'm coming up to a close here. Um, we surveyed all of the organizations we've worked in, uh, 93,000 programs in our database. And when it comes down to it, what's amazing to us is that the opportunity to partner, to look for uh, regional service optimization, partnerships, insourcing, outsourcing, represents about 60% of the budget of all the governments that we work in, meaning 40% is what we're truly uniquely qualified to provide that nobody else is in the business to do. Um, so in coming to a close, uh, as you do think about the initial thought experiment, the first question, if you could free up as much of your resources as possible to fund the future that you're trying to create, uh, this is Bruce Katz's last article, um, what would you actually do with it? What challenges would you take on? Um, and that is the whole concept of City as a Platform. That was a blitzkrieg, you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> cool.